Hi everybody, I'm Melanie from Charlotte County Libraries in History and today we are joined by a very special guest who's Adrian Young, the author of the Fable series and the Sky and Sea series. So Adrian, did you always want to be an author? Um, yeah, secretly. I, when I was a little kid, I, it was like my, you know, end all be all dream. If I could do anything in the world, I would want to be an author. But when, you know, I started getting older, like in high school, I felt like it wasn't a very viable aspiration. Like I thought that it wasn't realistic. <laughs> so, um, I never really planned to pursue it seriously until I was probably about like 24 or 25. I kind of was like adrift on what I wanted to do for the future and kept coming back to writing and decided to finally like really go for it. So I wouldn't have told anybody, um, <laughs> you know, that that's what I wanted to do, but it was like a secret hope. Like I al always harbored. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a specific writing process? Like how do you start? Um, I am very much like a go by the seat of my pants type creative. Um, sometimes I have had a couple projects where it ha I have done more structure on the front end, but um, for the most part, I'm very much a discovery writer. I kind of get inspired by something and I'll do my story development and, you know, kind of get the story to a place where I feel like it really has legs under it. And I know that if I jump off the cliff, like there's going to be somewhere to go. Um, but when I start the novel, I might have the uh, inciting incident or something, but I really don't have the whole thing plotted out in much detail. And I kind of just, they call it pantsing, like you're either <laughs> a plotter or you're a pantser and I'm, I'm totally a pantser. <laughs> so what kind of things give you the inspiration for your books? Um, I'm very, very much inspired by, um, you know, moods, music, aesthetics, settings, um, complicated relationship dynamics, especially as it relates to family. I feel like that's a reoccurring theme in all of my books thus far is, yeah. um, complicated family relationships and histories and all of that. Um, so I feel like a lot of times those are the wells that I'm drawing from the most. How hard is it to pick the first sentence of your book? Like, do you write that first or is that like one of the last things you come to? It's probably the hardest, one of the hardest parts for me because I agonize over my first lines. Um, and I do tend, I mean, I'm trying to think if there's an exception to this rule. I think all of my published books, the first line is the same as it was when I first wrote it. Oh, so, awesome. um, I, I tend to get really bad cold feet before I start drafting because <laughs> I know that when I pull up the blank page and I'm going to start drafting, if that first line doesn't feel right to me, then I feel like it just throws everything off and I can't go forward with momentum. And so I'll sit in front of the blank page like for a long time and I'll often like procrastinate that blank page moment just because I know like it's that stressful feeling of like, how do you open an entire story? Like what are the right words? And so I do tend to kind of obsess over that. Um, and first lines, even like first and last lines, but even down to chapters, like the last line of every chapter, I just have a, an, an immense feeling of like pressure about them. So for anyone who wants to be a writer, I know when I tried to start writing, um, I wanted to like go in order. Like I wanted to start with the first chapter and write through the book. Do you think that's realistic or do you think that people can just write however they want? I am a big, big proponent of write however feels good to you. Like I think everybody's process is really different. And I think it's when we're trying to fit ourselves into boxes that we really mess up our creative flow. And I did that for years and years. And so I think, you know, I'm, I'm somebody that I have to start at the beginning and I have to write all the way through to the end. But if you're somebody who is more, stays more inspired and motivated by hopping around to a different scene that feel like you feel like it's calling to you, you know, then I say, go for it and do it. Um, and then also just being open-minded to the fact that that process can change which, with every pro project too, because right. I feel like I had a different process for Sky in the Deep than I did for Namesake, you know, or in those 
processes were different from my adult novel um, that's coming out in the fall. I had a really different process for that one. So I feel like not only is it different for every writer, but it can change over time for each writer as well. Okay. So how do you approach character development? Do you think, do you have the plot first and then the characters fit or do you create your characters and then build a plot around them? My characters are first for sure. I tend to, I, story ideas come to me in like a moment, like a, like a scene, a picture, a little video clip or something in my mind. Um, and once I have that image, my story development process is really answering the like who, what, when, where, why of that image. And of course, a, the biggest part of that is who is this person in this setting, you know, for fable, it was a picture of a girl standing on a beach and she's watching a ship sail away. And I knew her father was on the ship and he wasn't coming back. And so I'm like, who is this girl? Where is she? Why is she on this island? Why is her father leaving her? You know, all of those things. That's all kind of the questions that kind of get my curiosity and inspiration going. And once I feel like I have enough of those questions answered to start the book, um, then that's usually like when I give myself the go ahead. So you said like you see video clips in your mind is that how you write your settings like do you see them before you start writing them because your setting description is like awesome like I can see it when I'm reading it thank you I'm really glad <laughs> that you feel that way I want readers to feel that way um and yeah I I really do I've, I've heard a lot of writers say this and I just really relate um to this idea that it's like and it, it's not it's not like this for everybody but for me it very much is kind of like watching a movie inside my head right and I can see it and I'm just trying to transcribe it like as quickly as the pictures are moving through my mind. And so um, that makes for like sometimes a very like stressful urgency yeah. of like trying to get it all down. I think especially in action scenes, I, this was very much the case in Sky in the Deep. Um, those action scenes are just playing out so quickly and I'm trying not to miss anything and I'm just trying to get it down. Um, so I feel like that's kind of how it comes to me is in these visuals inside my head and I'm just trying to capture it. So when you have like those visuals, do you ever just like record yourself like, okay, this needs to happen first and then they're going to go do this and this, or do you try and like type it as it comes to you? Um, I, I will like sometimes see the vague image of the next scene. Like I'll know a lot of times well, by the time I finish one chapter, I have an idea of what the next chapter is going to look like, but I I don't have it written down beat for beat. Um, and then there are elements of that chapter that are happening in real time. Like, I don't know what they're going to say, you know, right. I, don't, I don't know. I don't always know exactly where they're going to be or, um, you know, what plot points are going to like threads are going to come out in that scene. And I kind of just have to go with the flow of the scene and like how it's playing out in my mind. So I've heard some authors say that like their characters speak to them and tell them what they want to do. Is it like that for you? Do you like talk to your characters? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, I feel, I feel more so like I'm observing them. Um, like, like there's a story happening and I'm observing it okay. and I don't always have much control over where it's going. Cause I have, I've had the experience many times too, on a project where I try to force something to happen and it always snaps back. Like it yeah. always backfires and it always like, I have to go back to that place when I felt like the story was still driving itself and then things start clicking again. And so I, I feel like now I'm enough books in to where I've really learned my lesson on that. And I feel <laughs> like if I'm not, if I'm not following the story's lead or the character's lead, um, it really starts coming off as disingenuous and, and authentic. Like it doesn't feel like an organic story. It feels more like, um, you know, like I just pieced things together or something. Yeah. So which characters and places would you say stay with you the most out of all the books you've written? Um, I feel, I mean, Elin with Sky in the Deep is always going to be just like, so special to me. Yeah. I feel, felt so deeply connected to her. And, um, I, I do write myself into all of my characters, not just my main characters. Like, I feel like I put pieces of myself into my side characters, into my villains, like everybody. Um, and 
I feel like, especially with my main characters, they almost always reflect, not like they're based on me, but they will reflect something that I'm working through that yeah. I'm like, you know, um, kind of something I'm facing in life or a perspective change or a challenge I'm going through or some kind of evolution I'm experiencing. And so I almost feel like my main characters, especially are like little time capsules for me. Like now, like when I wrote Elin, I felt so like I could see myself in her in a lot of ways. Now it's like eight years later and I'm different, you know, and I I don't relate to Elin the same way I did, but she still feels like very much a part of me. So I feel like in a way that makes me feel really connected to all of my characters. Um, I do think that Elin and Fable, especially I felt, I have felt the most like they just really stick with me. Um, but the same is true for Bryn in the last legacy. And then also, um, as far as settings, I feel like the, that like misty, moody, dark world of, um, uh, the sky and sea, uh, duology, Mm -hmm. I feel like that still feels so visceral to me. And also even with the fable series and spells for forgetting, um, I feel like my settings are so much part of my inspiration that they feel like real places to me. Like that. I feel like I've been there and like Mm -hmm. I've experienced them. And sometimes they even feel a little bit of like a homesickness for them. So I, I definitely develop a deep bond with both setting and characters. Yeah. Reading um, Sky in the Deep, I was like, I want to go on a vacation to like this snowy mountain where all of this is happening because it was just so beautiful. So I know readers say they get book hanger hangovers all the time or like they finish a world and they're like, okay, what do I do next? Is that so much worse for authors? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Like as far as writing stories or reading? Mm -hmm. Like writing them, like after you're done, you're like, okay, do I want to leave the world or do I want to write more books for it? Yeah, it's, I mean, it is, there's a grieving <clears throat> process that happens for sure. Like with Sky in the Deep and The Girl the Sea Gave Back, I felt really strongly that those, I was done writing in that world. I never say never, you know, like I could in five years, I could suddenly be inspired to re-enter that world. And I always leave the door open for that. But I felt like it was an ending, like a close. Um, I don't really feel that for the fable series, even though I don't have more books contracted to come out in that world. I do feel like there's more story to tell and I'm, I'm hoping I get to tell it at some point. Um, but I do feel this like cleaving of like, you spend so much time in this imaginary world. And like I just said, like I, it feels real to me. And then all of a sudden you close the document and you've sent it off and you've done your past pages and it's going to print and it's done, you know? And it's just kind of like, oh man, like I can't, there's like a relief because it's so much work. And there's like this feeling of like exhaling, you know, like, oh, it's done. I, I did it. I finally did it. And, you know, all that work is behind me. But then on the other hand, there's very much this feeling of just like not wanting to let things go. Have you reread your books since they were published? Um, Yeah. Uh, Well, what I normally do is because I read it so many times by the time it goes to print, I'm like done. I'm done. Right. (laughs) Um, But what I like to do is write. So like from that time where I turn it in and it goes to print is usually, you know, six, nine, sometimes 10 months before it actually comes out, sometimes Mm -hmm. a year before, depending on your schedule. So at that point, I've had like almost a year long break from a book. And so I have this ritual of when a book comes out, then I like to listen to the audio book, like the week it comes out. So like throughout the week, starting on that Tuesday, I'll like listen to a few chapters a day. And it's kind of like a kind of, it feels like a little bit of like my own private celebration, you know, like just right. like it's done and enjoying it almost like as a reader, but in a different format than like reading it on an actual page. Um, and then it's really fun too, to get to hear the voice actors interpretation of things and representation of the characters. So that's kind of like a fun thing I look forward to. But then after that point, it's pretty rare that I'll go back and 
read a book. I'm, I'm doing a read along right now for the last legacy. And I've been rereading that book. And that's like the exception to the rule for sure. <laughs> um, so the covers for Fable and Namesink are beautiful. How much of a say do you get in like the covers or the voice actors for the audiobooks? Like, do you get a say in any of that? Yeah, you know, I am, I am very, very lucky that I have a team with my, especially with both of my publishers, actually my YA and my adult publishers, they're very collaborative. So I, I can also tell you from like, insider knowledge or whatever that most authors don't have that like a lot don't have yeah. any kind of creative control and although I'm definitely not the person calling the shots um I do feel like my opinion is really valued by my teams and the art departments and so with fable and namesake um I I mean I can't take any credit for fable that was like there was a mock-up done of the book using this photo and it was something that the art um the artist had just found online and she was just using it as an example she's like I want to do something like this and I want to have a photographer shoot it and whatever but I was so like I gasped out loud right. when I saw it and I was like no this is it don't shoot it with anybody else don't like please don't like is there any way we could find this photo, like get the rights to this photo that she randomly found on Google images. And That's so, so crazy. Um, I know. So luckily the art director was able to, um, uh, track down the photographer of this random photo on the internet. And she's a photographer in Russia. So they used Google translate to go back and forth <laughs> and like strike a deal about this photo so that we could use it on the cover. And, um, it just felt like, fate, you know? And so with namesake, we, there wasn't a plan to do the other half of the face, but, um, I, we were kind of like having conversations about it and brainstorming. And all of a sudden I was like, why don't we do the other half of her face? You know? So I kind of pitched that idea and kind of doing a more like bright, colorful, sun drenched. Mm -hmm. Um, she's a little more done up on that side. She's wearing jewelry, and it's very counter to the, the fable that we get to know in fable. And so, um, luckily everybody was on board with that idea and, you know, we were able to like make it happen. Um, but those, those covers in particular are really special because readers just love them so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I understand why too. I love them. Yeah. When the second one came out, I was like, oh, they go together. Yes. <laughs> So not to give any spoilers or anything, I'll ask this question very vaguely. Do you know who will become couples before you start writing? Or do you think that develops as the story develops? I usually know. Yeah. I mean, there might be like a side romance thing that happens. Like there's one in Namesake that took me by surprise a little bit, even though it's not an explicit love story. Um, there's hints. And I kind of was like, hmm, hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, but I also, you know, the, as far as the main characters go, I pretty much know who their counterpart is going to be. And, um, even if I don't know exactly how the relationship is going to develop, I, I have a sense, you know. So this, for the sky in the deep, it seems like it has a lot of like Viking and Norse influence. How do you decide what time period or like what cultural influence are going to be part of your stories? I feel like I don't really go looking or, um, you know, I don't feel like I really decide. It's more just like, where is my inspiration coming from? With Sky in the Deep, I didn't really set out to write a Viking book. It was more, I had, again, the picture that came to me and it was this girl on a battlefield. She was like covered in blood. She's holding, you know, her weapons and all of that. And I could see this very like misty, like blues and greens landscaping and all of that. And so I, to me, once I started developing the story, it felt very Nordic to me. Um, so I started pulling from Nordic like inspiration to kind of build the world. And, um, it kind of just went down that vein. It felt very natural. And then the same with the fable series, I didn't set out to write like an age of sale fantasy, but that's really using that inspiration made a lot of sense in order to construct the world building and even just like the level of technology they had and how they got around. And like, it was a really good fit. And so even though they're not 
you know, historical fantasies per se, they, they're definitely, you know, through research, I feel like I both directly and subconsciously pull these different um, elements from an actual time period. How much research do you have to do on your books? Like for Sky in the Deep, did you have to research like wounds and anatomy to be able to accurately like depict what was happening? Yes. Um, writers make the joke all the time that we're probably on FBI watch list. You know? <laughs> all the things that we Google and, um, (laughs) you know, just different things. It's, it's really funny because you have to sometimes research the most specifically bizarre sentence to get the information you're looking for. But, um, yeah, for, for, uh, sky in the deep there in the girl, the sea back, I did a ton of research on Nordic history and mythology and, just, um, you know, social hierarchy and landscape and geography and all of that stuff. But I also did a lot of um, research on like weaponry and fighting styles and wounds and like in medicinal things like at, at that time, like how did they treat wounds? How did they stitch? What did they use for a needle? What did they, you know, these different questions that arise that you don't really think of, um, how did they cook their food, you know, and did they have pans or did they just do open fire cooking? Like there's so (laughs) many things, like once you get into a scene and you're putting together just the mechanics, it's, you run into all these questions where you're just like, wait, that doesn't feel right. That's not accurate. Would they really have an iron pan at the time that they don't have this other, you know, right. developed item or whatever? But then with the Fable series, um, it's a lot of similar research as far as like time period, historical, um, even like what fabrics were that were clothes made out of at this time and things like that. But the biggest thing was sailing because yeah. sailing is a whole. I mean, I really <laughs> I underestimated the amount of knowledge you really need to depict sailing accurately because it's not just this you know huge ship but there are a lot of different kinds of ships yeah and you need certain technologies to make certain types of ships and then once you have the ship well what kind of sails does it have because there's a lot of different kinds of sails and is it a two mast or a three mast a one mast and you know what do storm sails do what are those used for what do they look like how are they shaped how are they stitched you know yeah. there there's that whole physical element and then there's the whole scientific side of like how do you sail in a storm how do you what way do you turn the helm you know if you're trying to go this way versus that way well it depends on which the way the wind is blowing or the current is going against the ship or whatever and it's just so much information. (laughs) Like I, I thought I could kind of like fly by the seat of my pants a little bit on the sailing stuff and then go back later and kind of correct things. And that is not what happened. I had to do so much research, um, just to even get them from point A to point B in the book. Do you think you could sail a ship? No, (laughs) absolutely not. Like I would have to go to like a sailing school. Like (laughs) you have to either learn by like kind of like apprenticeship, like being on a ship and being taught by a captain, or you have to like take actual courses and stuff because it's just so easy to flip or sink a ship. You yeah. Know? Like when you're dealing just with wind, it's one thing to have a motor, but like if you're sailing, it's like a whole thing. What was the most interesting thing you learned in your research for any of your books? Um, I think, you know, one thing I thought was really fascinating when I was doing research on the Vikings um, and Nordic people in general is that the Vikings, as far as we know, are one of, or the first, or one of the first um, societies to ever have a uh, whole set of laws protecting women. And um, they had, I mean, they were still very highly patriarchal, you know, society and women didn't have as many rights as men, but it was very, very, um, progressive at the time to have laws that actually protected women from like unwanted treatment, unwanted advances from men, even like coming on to women where it wasn't welcome was like a punishable offense, you know, and that was unheard of during this time in human history. And, 
Um, the United States didn't even have laws like that until the 1960s, you know? So I, I found that to be fascinating. That is really cool. <laughs> so um, all of your books, for the most part, have been from like the heroine's point of view. Um, was writing Saint more difficult? Because it seems like it's from his point of view. It's actually dual POV, which people oh, awesome. don't totally know that yet because it's only arcs have only just started going out. Right. Um, but yeah, it's dual POV, but he, I do feel like he is the anchor character. Um, and I absolutely loved writing from his perspective. I adored it. I, I could have written the whole book from his POV, but I did, there were so many things I really wanted to get from Isolde's perspective. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that readers are going to really love his perspective as well, but it is kind of balanced by that female POV as well. Do you think it was harder for you to like put yourself in his mind or you said it was just easier, like you loved writing it? You know, I have found um, writing from a male perspective feels easier to me. And I, I don't know why. Um, I have had this experience because uh, the girl to say, see gave back is dual POV. Um, I found this in that book where I had a much easier time writing Halvard's perspective than um, Tova's. And then with um, Spells for Forgetting, there, I mean, one of the main characters who his POV is throughout the book, um, that's a male, but also there are some side characters who are males who have um, POVs as well, like sprinkled in. And I just, I, it kind of reinforced this idea of like, I really enjoy writing from a male perspective. And then when it came to Saint, um, it was the same thing where I was just like, I love this. And I don't know why, like, I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if it just feels different or, and so I'm more inspired by it. Or if for, there's something about me that connects more with that male perspective. Um, but even my next YA series um, uh, is a duology. It's the first one's not coming out for um, another year and a half or something. But um, that one is told half by a male perspective as well. And I felt the same way as that one too. So I don't know. I don't know why, but um, I really, it feels almost easier to me. Hmm, that's cool. Do you have a favorite book or like a top five favorite books or something like that? Like that you love reading that helps you like get inspired? Um, yeah, I mean... I, there's probably more than five, but I feel like <laughs> one's off like the top of my head that like are just classic favorites that I could go back and read again and again are like, um, like one of the earliest ones for me was a tree grows in Brooklyn, um, as a child was probably my most inspiring book. And I've read it so many times. Um, and then daughter of smoke and bone, that series oh, by Lena yeah. Taylor is a really big one for me. A I'm good series. Yes. So inspired by her and her storytelling skills, just her and her prose. Oh my gosh. So good. Um, I also have more recently in the past couple of years have loved song of Achilles, um, mm -hmm. is a really big one. Um, the glass castle is another that I just could go back and read again and again. So I feel like they're kind of, they run the gamut really of, um, a lot of different ones. I I'm also extremely, extremely inspired by Tana French. Um, I love, love her writing as well. What are your main hobbies outside of writing? Um, well, I practice yoga. I love to go hiking. Um, I actually do Olympic weightlifting, oh, which wow. is kind of a very random thing that came up in my life several years ago. And, um, now that the pandemic, you know, has started to get better, I have gotten, um, uh, kind of revived that as well. Um, but cooking, I love cooking. Um, yeah, kind of like a bunch of random things. And then, um, last question, you mentioned you had another, um, YA series coming out soon. Is there anything you can tell us about that or do we have to wait? Yeah. I mean, it's, so I can't say a ton about it, but it's, um, it's really funny readers. I feel so bad. Readers have been waiting for this book for quite a while now because I actually sold it 
after I finished namesake. And then I wound up selling the last legacy and saint. And so this duology has gotten bumped down the pipeline so that we can finish coming out with these other fable books. But, um, the working title that we have always referred to them as is the fallen city duology. Okay. And, um, they're like a Greco Roman inspired fantasy and they take place inside of a walled city under siege. And it's a very kind of complex layered story um, that has like a lot of different characters and um, you know, the, the main plot line is kind of influenced by a war that happened many years in the past. And so it's kind of, there's a lot of the same hallmarks as my other young adult fantasies but the setting is really different and um, it's also multiple perspective as well. I'm so excited for that. Like Trojan War and like Greek mythology, everything's like one of my favorite types of novels to read. So like, I'm, I'm really excited for that. Yeah, so I'm super excited. I think the first one is coming out in 24. Okay. Um, so we will, you know, we're, we're getting there slowly but surely. <laughs> well, thank you so much for letting us interview today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for the like very thoughtful questions. I love oh. questions like this. So <laughs> good. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.